ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> thank you for coming back. I need to thank you yet again for coming tonight and allowing me this opportunity. What I'm going to say tonight, what I'm going to do tonight, will be one of the riskiest things I've ever done in my life. Every bit as risky as pulling a gun and walking to the helicopter. Every bit as risky as some of the other crazy stunts I've pulled. I'm going to say things tonight that are not supposed to be said publicly. I'm going to say things that people in my position are not supposed to say traditionally. But it's time that the tradition broke. I've told you that I escaped from prison. I've told you about my being on death row. I didn't tell you how the story started. So we're kind of doing the story backwards. And in explaining that story tonight, I need you to act and function exactly like a jury. And it, I don't, has anybody here been to a trial out of curiosity? Really? Really? <laughs> well, you don't count, Mr. Phillips. You know? <laughs> All right. So you know that at the beginning of trials, when the jury is impaneled after they've been selected, but before we actually begin the trial, there are opening statements. Usually it's done by the prosecutor. In some counties, it's done by the judge. And what the judge tells the jury is this. What I need you to do is set aside your own preconceived notions about this case. Be willing, be able to set aside your emotions. And let's look at nothing but the facts of the case. Hear the entire case before reaching a decision, before you render your verdict. Be objective, because your verdict matters. And I told you last week, it is no chance that you were here by accident. And I believe that with all my heart. And the verdict you render tonight will affect the rest of my life, I promise you. And it's just that serious to me. Now, before I begin, I want to give you a quick legal lesson in murder. There are, in fact, several ways to commit murder. And I, I don't mean choice of weapon or anything like that. There are degrees of murder in the state of Florida. First degree murder means that you were, you, person A, intentionally caused the death of person B. This person owed this person money, he was angry about it, he went and killed him. That's intentional. First degree murder, that is the highest crime we have in the United States. We put people to death for it. The next level down is what we call second degree murder. Second degree murder is when you didn't really plan to murder, but it happened anyways. That's when bar fights go wrong, or you come home and catch your husband in bed with somebody else, and bam, that's it. Done deal. Crimes of passion. And that's graded just a little bit less. Then we have third degree murder. Third degree murder is when you're committing one crime, let's say a robbery, and somebody is accidentally killed during that, that situation. You didn't really mean for that to happen, but it did, and it was a result of another crime happening. And that's the next level down. And then we have manslaughter. And manslaughter means I wasn't really trying to kill anybody. I was just careless in what I was doing, uh, driving recklessly, and somebody gets hit. We've all heard of vehicular manslaughter. And that's the lowest degree of murder. So my point in that is that not all murders are created equal. They're not all the same. And I'm asking you to understand the distinction between them. The next thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to explain in the second half of what I'm going to talk about tonight, is that what you thought the law was is not what it is in Florida. And I'm going to explain that to you with slides because I'm going to actually show you the law in Florida and show you that what I'm saying is what it is. That's the law you're in me. I want evidence. I want proof. I want you to prove it to me, just like we do in a trial. And I want you to hold me to that standard. Having said that, I want to begin by showing you a disciplinary report that I received while in, oh, Kay, where are we? Are we under photos? No. When I was, uh, while I was incarcerated, my last six years were actually spent right down the road at Columbia CI main unit, which is, I'm sure some folks in here probably know is a maximum security unit. While there, oh, it's on this screen, never mind. I'll tell you the background. While I was there, we had a shakedown one day. A whole bunch of officers come in and they search for contraband. 
And there I was minding my own business, which is my favorite phrase. I was minding my own business when some guards came in, searched our room. My roommate was sitting on his top bunk, holding his laundry bag, kind of cradling it. Inside the laundry bag were several gallons of homemade wine. The laundry bag had his name on it. So there's no question whose wine this, this was. When the disciplinary report was written, and I don't see it up there. We missed it on scanning it. Darn it. That's all right. Oh, okay. I may forget to do that. Right in the middle of the disciplinary report, I, we thought we copied it for you. Let me back up. We only decided to do these slides maybe 30 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago. So we, we literally, up to the last minute, were scrambling to get these into the computer and onto the screen. But right in the middle of the disciplinary report, and I had underlined and highlighted it for you, it said, inmate Edwards, who's my roommate, admitted that the wine was his. It says right in the report. His bunk, his room, he was holding it, he admitted it was his. I'm the one that received the disciplinary report and spent 30 days in disciplinary confinement. I appealed it to the warden, he didn't want to hear it. Appealed it to the secretary of the department, she didn't want to hear it. Now, the reason I wanted you to see it, and I'm really sorry you can't, is to show you that the Department of Corrections does not care. Does not care what the facts are. That department does not care if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. They don't care. I, again, I wanted you to see the actual proof. While I was in my final two years of prison, I sent a request to the warden asking permission to get into the computer program at the, at the, depart, at the prison, and I was denied. The reason I wanted to do that was because when I was still in isolation, I think I mentioned this last, last week, I earned a paralegal degree specializing in criminal law and procedure. I did that. The department did not pay for that. The department did not provide the materials, and they certainly did not provide the encouragement. I did that. Because I wanted to be rehabilitated. I didn't want to come back to prison. I did not want to be a statistic. By God, I wanted to move on with my life and do something. But it wasn't just one. I gotta see if I can do this. I am not talented for this though. I went and earned a second paralegal degree. One wasn't enough. This one in general law. Because again, I wanted to reduce the chances that I would be a statistic. And we're going to come back to this, the recidivism. Everybody know what recidivism means? Okay, for those who don't, recidivism is the rate at which people return to prison after being released. Did you go out and commit a new crime? I didn't want to be one of those guys. Really didn't want to commit the one that put me in. Now, I was denied the computer program. Now, if I'd have had more time, I would have scanned it into the computer and showed you. I have a document with the warden's signature on it saying he was not allowing me to participate in rehabilitation because of my crimes. Well, that's stupid. Isn't that what I went to the Department of Corrections for? Doesn't make sense. All right, you don't want me in the computer program. Maybe, you, I don't know, maybe you don't want me learning computer fraud or I don't know what, what he was thinking. So I asked permission to be in the computer repair program. I was denied because of my crimes. I asked permission to be in the culinary arts program, which I did not want to be in, but I wanted to be in something. And I was denied in writing. I asked for permission to be in the masonry program. I really did not want to be a bricklayer coming home, but something was something. And I was denied. So I asked for permission to participate in the mental health program, which I'm gonna describe in just a moment, for the purpose of rehabilitation. That's the whole purpose. Change your thinking, change, change your thought patterns. And I was denied for that as well. Every step of the way, when I asked for help, I was told no, because of the crimes that sent me to prison. How does that make you, the audience, safer? How does that make you, the juror, safer? For me as a prisoner to come home with no rehabilitation after 22 years, no counseling, no education, how does that make you safer? And I don't think it does. 
Now I'm going to say the one thing that I swore I would never stand in front of a church and say. And it's the one thing I have not wanted to tell you. I am trusting you. <laughs> I am trusting you to hear what I'm saying. I went to prison because of a sex offense. I am a convicted sex offender. I am the boogeyman they talk about on the news. I am the man they pass laws for. And what I'm not supposed to be doing is standing in front of you and telling you that. Most convicted sex offenders, no, all convicted sex offenders hide in the shadows. They want to hide. They're ashamed of what they did. They're embarrassed by what they did, and reasonably so. They crawl under rocks and they hide there. That does not make society safer. Now, in 1994, while I was still a member of the Department of the Navy, I went to Nova University in Fort Lauderdale to study psychology. Uncle Sam was helping me pay for it. Part of my internship, I had to spend in a Department of Juvenile Justice facility where I worked with teenage convicted sex offenders. One of the young men there did not want to be there, so he went to the lobby and picked up a payphone and dialed 911, contacted the sheriff's office, and said that myself and a few other nurses were engaging in sexual conduct with him that was illegal. He was 15 years old and already a twice convicted sex offender. He accused me, a military veteran. Now, I'm going to show you the law in Florida. I'm reading from Florida Statute 794.022, paragraph 1. For those of you in the back who can't see it, the testimony of the victim need not be corroborated in a prosecution under 787, 794, or 800. Those are sex offense statutes. The victim's testimony need not be corroborated. In plain English, all it takes is an accusation. That's it. A student who wants to get out of a particular class only has to make an accusation against a teacher. That teacher is going to jail. Period. Daughter's angry at her father because he punished her for going out late at night. She makes an accusation. He is going to jail on nothing but her word. They don't need DNA. It's not like TV. They don't need DNA. They don't need fingerprints. They don't need video surveillance. They don't need third-party eyewitnesses. All they need is an accusation. No other crime under Florida law requires nothing but that. Any other crime you name, any other crime. Imagine a murder case where all there is is an accusation. Oh, we don't need a body. We don't need a weapon. We don't need a motive. We don't need any of that. Can you imagine? And do you think that the children in the United States today don't know that? Do you think they're not being told that in school? I've seen the ads on TV, so I know they're hearing it in school. Now, the reason I escaped was because I didn't do this crime. And nobody wanted to hear it. You're accused of a sex offense, you're guilty. That's all there is to it. And I went to prison for that. And you can imagine, it wasn't fun. It was not fun at all. Here's the crazy part. That right there is a sworn affidavit written by my victim 13 years later. 13 years later. I'm going to read the top line for those in the back who can't see it. Subject, the accusations of sexual abuse which I made back in November of 1994 against Stephen Whitsett, that would be me, were false. <laughs> 13 years later, he admitted it. It's too late. I already did the time. What good is your apology now? Because you can't take that off the internet. Now, let me tell you that I did, in fact, file an appeal in Broward County, and I say, wait a second, I was innocent. Can I get my name cleared? Now remember, the victim's testimony need not be corroborated. That was enough to put me in prison. Well, shouldn't the victim's word be enough to get me out? 
under Florida law, no. Because you don't know if he was lying then or if he's lying now. And the presumption of guilt remains. I will live with that conviction the rest of my life. There's no getting around it. Let me show you something else. I'm going to show you my driver's license, and I'm going to ask you to please forgive the fact that the picture is horrible. My driver's license. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner of my driver's license, you're going to see a series of numbers. Those numbers tell anyone who looks at that license that I am a convicted sex offender. Every time I get pulled over by a policeman, he sees that. Thankfully, I haven't been pulled over. I drive like, well, I was going to say like an old woman, but I don't want to anybody. <laughs> I drive slow. But every time I cash a check, I'm a convicted sex offender. Every time I want to buy alcohol, which I don't, but if I wanted to, they all know I'm a convicted sex offender. It's, I'm constantly reminded. I'm constantly reminded. I'm never allowed to move on. Every six months, I am required to register with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and I don't know if we copied that. We did not. Sorry about that. We didn't. I will never outlive it. I am university educated with two minor law degrees. You just saw them. I turned my life around, I think. And I can't get a job worth anything but barely above minimum wage. No one will hire me. Every single time I have applied for a job, and Father Doug's been involved in a few of those situations, every single time I applied for a job that was worth anything, that would allow me to move on with my life, I told them up front, just like I'm telling you, I told them exactly what my situation was. And they told me, it was, oh, that's, all, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. We believe in second chances. And they believed in second chances up until my criminal report came in. And then nobody wanted to talk to me anymore. Nobody wanted to talk to me anymore. Now, thankfully, my case is old enough that some of the newer sex offense laws do not apply. But there are laws out there, as you know, that do not allow sex offenders to live within city limits. So men coming out of prison after however many years have nowhere to live and they can't get jobs. Do you feel safer now? And I, I mean, I'm literally asking, do you feel safer? You cannot. If I am not vested in society, if I don't have something of value, that a, a place in society, then I don't give a damn about society. Some of you, actually quite a few of you, have asked would I write a book about this. And in fact, I did write a book. I did. I have done nothing with it because I didn't think anybody would actually be interested in it. But I cataloged exactly how this situation went in glowing detail, and I actually have the documents in the book. But at the conclusion of the book, I asked a question. At what point does a sex offender who has nothing to lose and nothing to gain, if that person is going to wear that label the rest of their lives, I'm a perfectionist. I believe in being the best at whatever I do. You want to accuse me of being a sexual predator? And I have nothing else to lose? Let me show you how good I can be. That's the danger we're facing. That's the danger we're facing. Our laws on sex offenses are creating a problem that we as a society are going to pay a very dear price for down the road. Now, the crazy thing is, you've been lied to by the legislatures. I know that surprises you, but you've been lied to. They tell you that they don't allow sex offenders to live within a certain distance of schools to protect the children. It makes sense, right? I have done my homework. In 22 years of studying law, I have never found a single case, not a single one, not one, where somebody went to a school to sexually assault a child. Not one. And I challenge anyone here to come up with a name because there isn't one. I've checked the databases. But at least once a week, we're arresting teachers for having sex with students. The predators are already in the school. 
What's crazy is if someone goes to prison for killing a child, and I know men who have gone to prison for killing infants and got no more than seven years. I have seen it. Those people who killed children, murdered them, are allowed to live right next to a school. They can live within 50 feet if they want to. That's safe. I'm more afraid of a drunk driver living near a school. They're the bigger danger. Someone convicted of child abuse, why aren't they being excluded? Makes you wonder. How does having, I already took it down, how does having my driver's license tagged make you safer? What does it have to do with your neighborhoods? Nothing. Just the other day, I went, well, not the other day, that's an exaggeration. A couple months ago, I went and got my passport. I am so afraid of the United States. I am so afraid of where these sex offense laws are going that I have a passport and money set aside for an emergency ticket the day I decide I need to return to Germany. I'm that scared of where we're going. Every time the legislature meets, they pass new sex offense laws that you don't hear about because they don't affect you. Every legislative session, a new law, a new law, a new law, a new law. Where does it end? At what point am I allowed to move on with my life? Now let's, let's forget the fact that the victim recanted. Let's put that aside. Let's assume I'm just as guilty as the devil for what he accused me of. He was 15, I was 22. Into the world? No, I don't think so. I'm going to bet good money, and I don't want anybody to raise a hand, but I'm going to bet good money that there are people here who, when they were in high school, had relationships that would have landed one of the two of you in prison. I virtually guarantee it. How am I any different than you? Simply because I went to jail for it? That's assuming arguendo that I did it. Now, you already know I'm big on personal responsibility. I'm big on it. And I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I'm 100% innocent, that I'm some clean lamb. I am not. I assure you I am not. But 24 years later, I'm not the man I was in 1994. I've been through the fire that I talked about that leads to maturity. I've been there. I've made my choices. And come hell or high water, whatever it takes, I am not going to back down. I'm going to live exactly as I believe is correct, which is by the law and by the rule. We need prosecutors. We need policemen. We need prisons. I have sat and eaten dinner with the people you do not want in your neighborhood. I can name them. I can name people that are better off dead in a ditch than walking in your neighborhood. And I know that's making a judgment call. I understand that. But I know these people. You can look in their eyes and see there is, there's nothing there. These are people who've proven they should not be, in, and they, they should not be walking free. So when I was talking earlier in my first talk about the graveyard, and we were talking about labels, if I had walked in here before you knew any, anything else about me and I had simply told you or had someone else tell you that I was a sex offender, you would have had a certain view of me. Would you not? But now talking over the last three weeks, because I've gotten to know quite a few of you and I'm, I'm actually, I can't even tell you what that's meant. I, actually, I will tell you what that's meant in a moment. But I am not that label. I am so much more than that. I am so much more and so are you. Nobody here should have to wear a label and be identified by the worst moment in their life. Nobody should have to do that. Because by putting a label on someone and keeping them in that place, you are not allowing them to move on. You are not. And I am one who happens to believe that sex offenses are pretty heinous. I have seen and read about some pretty rough ones. But let's also not confuse forcible rape with a stupid, indiscreet relationship. And of course, there, there's a, 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 no, what's the spectrum. There's a spectrum that goes from ridiculously violent to this is just, uh, it's a waste of court taxpayer money to prosecute it. I don't know how we change it. Father Doug and I have been talking for months. How do you change a system? How do you get some of these laws rolled back to where they're common sense? That's what I'm asking for, common sense laws. We need these laws to protect vulnerable people. We need them. 
but please, can we have pragmatic, practical laws, practical answers to practical questions. We had this shooting in Parkland, and as, as crazy as it is, as it sounds, my parents live very, very close to Parkland. They live in Pembroke Pines, just a little south. And we have, we're still recovering from the emotion of that, that horrible shooting, horrific shooting. And we're already passing laws about it? When did we stop to think these laws through? When did we read them? Has anybody in this room actually read the text of the new law they just passed for Parkland? Any hands? Because I've tried. I can't get a hold of the text. And that's what happens. You, you know, we talk about the Jimmy Rice Act. Anybody here know the Jimmy Rice Act? I'm curious. You don't count, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> You're familiar with it? The boy that hung himself for the Hollywood Mall? Uh, no, not the Hollywood Mall. That was Adam Walsh. Homestead, Redwood. Okay. Okay. There are no children in here, correct? I want to make sure. All right. Jimmy Rice was nine years old when he was kidnapped by Juan Carlos Chavez. The book I wrote, the very first paragraph, which Father Doug has read, I tell you, I didn't kill Jimmy Rice. But I was punished for Jimmy Rice. The Jimmy Rice Act allows the state of Florida to continue indefinitely the incarceration of any sex offender that the state deems too dangerous to release. Well, what's the criteria for too dangerous? The legislature didn't give us a definition. They left it up to the individual judges. What the hell is too dangerous? What is that? If you've seen my sister drive, she's too dangerous to be in the free world. <laughs> Thank God she lives in Canada. <laughs> but the Jimmy Rice Act allows them to suspend the release after you've done your time, after you've been punished, after you did what you were supposed to do to repay your debt to society. They say, no, we want you to serve longer. What's the purpose of a judgment then? What's the purpose of a judicial sentence if they can just suspend it? The law was passed in May of 1999 and went into effect June 1st of 1999. I was, I am sorry to say, the 33rd man confined under the Jimmy Rice Act. When I escaped, I escaped from the Jimmy Rice Act prison. For a 15 year old, been arrested one time. For a 15-year-old, when I was 22, they said that I was too dangerous to be released. I was scared of the jury. I told you that. Can you imagine why now? I was afraid that I would go in front of a jury and the, and the judge, or the prosecutor, I'm sorry, the prosecutor would say, well, Mr. Whitsett is a convicted sex offender. That's a fact. The question is, do you want him living in your neighborhood? Because under the Jimmy Rice Act, they can't just issue an order. They have to take you in front of a jury, and the state gets to give all the reasons why they think you're too dangerous. And when I tell you they will throw mud at you, they will throw mud at you you didn't even know about. And if they're lacking witnesses, they will find them. And I was terrified of having to stand in front of a jury like you folks. And, and to be honest, I'm terrified right now. But I'm going to do this. <laughs> I was terrified. But I did not expect obviously, was for the jury to find me not guilty. And that's the actual verdict. If you type my name in the internet, which is why I did not give you my name when we began this, you can see my name written right there at the top, you will see hundreds, if not thousands, of newspaper articles with my name in them concerning the escape, and every single one of them described me as a sexually violent predator. What none of those articles will tell you is that a jury actually reviewed my case and a jury said no. So I'm not asking you to take my word for it. There it is. There's the verdict. Want to know why I can't get a job worth anything other than minimum wage? There it is right there, folks. I was found not guilty but I'm still guilty.
rest of my life, that will be on the internet, and there's no getting around it. I have, I am not the person I was. I am not. If you ask me, was prison worth it? 22 years of incarceration, 3,651 days in isolation, was it worth it? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes, because in a very real sense, it saved my life. I didn't know who I was. You find out real quick when you're in the middle of the fire. Any of you gentlemen who've been in combat know exactly what I'm talking about. You find out who and what you are real quick. And I now know exactly who I am. But if I go hide in a cave, if I go underneath a rock and hide, I'm a coward. I can't be a coward. I want my life. I want a place in society. I want to live among you people. I want to socialize with you. You are the ones, you are the ones who make it worth it. I don't want to live with the thieves and the liars and the murderers and the rapists. I don't want to live with them. I want to go where you're going. Better place. I want better. And the only way to change the system is one person at a time. Because that's what systems are made up of. You can't change the Department of Corrections because that's a bunch of barbed wire and a bunch of concrete buildings. And I've been asked, I was asked by the FBI two weeks ago, was it? Two weeks ago, the FBI asked me, am I still angry at the Department of Corrections? No, I was never angry at the Department of Corrections. I put me in prison, not them. But it's individual people that make up the department. So if you're asking me, am I angry at particular correctional officers? The answer is no, they didn't put me in prison. I don't hate individual people. It's the same thing true with you say, well, the law. I can't change the law, but I can change indiv individual people's minds. I can change their hearts. And I'll tell you where it must begin. I'm looking at every single one of you. Even if I can't connect directly, I'm looking at every single one of you, and I'm saying, stop telling me, please stop telling me that you believe in second chances. Stop it. I've heard it till I'm sick of it. Stop telling me you believe in second chances. Start showing me. Every prospective employer I've gone to has told me they believe in second chances. None of them gave me a job. Stop telling me. Stop telling me that. I've had employees. Oh, we believe in second chances. We're not going to treat you differently because I don't, I don't hide at work. And I have employees right here in the front row that will tell you. I do not hide at work why I went to prison or what I'm doing with my life. And I've been judged for it. I am not the one to hide in the shadows. This has got to change. Somebody has got to stand up and push back. Here I am. Give me a second chance. Please give me a second chance. Not asking for a favor, I'm asking for a chance. I'm asking for the opportunity to prove myself. Because I will. I really, really appreciate you allowing me to speak to you. I never believed I would have stood in front of a church congregation. I swore I'd never step foot in a church again. And here we are. <laughs> Some of you have asked if I wrote a book, and I said I did. We've, we, Father Doug and I, have not done much with it. What I'd like to ask is if anybody's actually interested in reading such a book, uh, Kay's going to have who? Who are you pointing at? Clipboard. We're going to have a clipboard. I'll, I'll have it at the back. If you'd please just put your name and a contact information. If, if anybody's interested, we're going to go ahead and, and knock some copies out just to see. We, I haven't really done anything much with the book because, as I said, I didn't know if anybody would actually be interested. But we are hoping to be able to take our message of personal responsibility, of change, of second chances not only into the prison system, but into the law enforcement community as well. I am really surprised, really surprised at the support we have gotten from the law enforcement community. I actually thought they would be my problem coming home, and in fact, they have been so supportive, it's crazy. It's just ridiculous. I have correctional officers that I knew in prison come to where I work just about once a, often at least once a week. Sometimes more. 
sometimes more than that, just to say hello and tell me to keep doing what I'm doing. It's not what I thought the free world was going to be like. So where we go from here, we'll see. I would absolutely love to hear your feedback. I would, if you think I'm wrong on something, I would love to hear about it. If you think I need to reconsider something from a particular angle, I would love to hear about it. I want to be right. At the end of the day, I want to be right. It's not about my ego. Because there are lives in prison that need changes made. There are lives that need to be saved.